sort of sense of proportion. I'm not put too many slides together because the, the last thing was they have me talking at you for an hour and a half. Um, if there's anything, well, it, it also I, I will admit disguises the fact that although we, we've uh, had a lot of very interesting uh, discoveries uh, last year, and it's clearly that the site is getting to a very fascinating phase, we're still in that awkward um, period of not quite knowing what what on earth is going on. It's very fascinating. We're just not sure quite what all of it means just yet. Uh, something which I hope we will start to rectify um, during this summer. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that we've been digging through midden deposits and things we can interpret very easily for, for a number of years in 23 now. And we've, we've, get, we've gotten back into the first millennium AD. I think we're, the, the levels we're at now are probably um, 10th, 11th century. So we're into really the time when the castle is perhaps at its most important. Uh, and the archaeology is starting to reflect that. You know, our progress has slowed as we try to identify just what it is we're uncovering and excavating through. Uh, this is the slide I usually start with whenever I do a lecture. Um, tonight, given that the castle is just outside the hill, perhaps just a little bit superfluous, but you, you can't because I'm tired of looking at Bamber Castle anyway. Uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning is our logo, uh, which is based on the, the chair stroke throne fragment, uh, which is sort of um, 8th, 9th century AD carved sculptural fragment, which was found in the castle grounds. And the reason this is uh, particularly relevant this summer is that when Time Team do their three-day events, they like what they refer to as a cameo, uh, where Phil Harding um, basically has, turns his hand to some craft or something like that. And this, for us, it's going to be a bit of stone carving because we have two excellent masons at the castle uh, who are chafing at the bit to have a go at reconstructing the, the complete um, chair, or what I, what I suspect it is, is an Anglo-Saxon throne, throne of the kings of Northumbria, and they've been practicing carving uh, these zoomorphic beasts, so that should be fascinating. Uh, we will be doing a second lecture, um, probably in the autumn, to bring you up to date with what's happening this summer, because we're hoping that this will be a bit of a bumper uh, season. We're getting LIDAR, which is a ground-based laser uh, survey, uh, done within the castle, and this, this scans everything, including every single stone in the fortress, down to about four millimeters accuracy. So it will, it will enable us to create a, a, a fabulous computer model. So uh, it should be, uh, as Jerry was saying, a very exciting season at Bamber. We do know an awful lot about the medieval castle, um, mostly through the work of others. Uh, this is a plan that I compiled for the book I wrote a few years ago. It's everything we can work out about the layout of the, of the castle as it was as a, med <coughs> a medieval fortress. The one element that's misleading are the, the east and west wards, these two apparently blank areas certainly wouldn't have been blank. Uh, we know that as much from our trenches in the west ward as anything else. There are stables, horse mills, all sorts of features mentioned in the text, but we just simply have no idea, unless we find them archaeologically, uh, where they lie. But you can see that you know, at the heart of the fortress, right at the top of the hill, uh, a, a marvellous construction. You've got the great keep there built in the middle of the 12th century. Uh, the, the great hall, the kitchen, buttery pantry, and two storerooms, rook bakehouse and brew house just beyond. And the little chapel of St. Oswald, uh, built by Henry II, tucked away in the corner. Uh, so we know an awful lot about the medieval fortress. And I'm going to touch, uh, I'm going to talk mostly tonight about uh, the last year's excavations here in the West Ward. Uh, which is right at the base of the hill, but still within the defended perimeter. And I, I, although I mentioned it last year, I'm going to very quickly recapitulate what we uh, did in the chapel the previous season, uh, because we've had time to analyse it a bit more, and I'm a little bit more confident about which walls uh, fit together. So um, I'm not going to dwell too long on that, because obviously we, we've discussed it before, but I'll, I'll go through that quickly, just to bring people up to date. Also, because if you manage to make the, the next lecture, uh, one of the other things that Time Team are hoping to do is to do a radar survey, a ground penetrating radar survey of the whole of the inner ward, um, looking to see if we can identify the location of the, of the, the Anglo Saxon Royal Hall and the, the Basilica of St. Peter, which is mentioned in Bede and following authors, uh, as being in existence at Bound before around the middle of the, of the 7th century. Uh, so, hopefully, what we, we found physically. Uh, underneath the chapel in the previous season, we will be able to fit into a bigger picture, providing the radar survey um, does its thing in July. So this is the west wall. This is the, the, the lowest part of the fortress. It's, uh, I suppose, the ancillary end. Uh, you can see St. Oswald's Gate coming up with the steps here. 
Um, our trench one, it's, uh, that's a, an older outline, it's grown a little bit this way, it's extended to the, the steps since that one was done. And trench three, where we are uh, following in the footsteps of Ryan Hope Taylor. I'll discuss each trench in turn in brief. All of the finds that you will see at the back uh, will have come from one of these two trenches. And if anything you, you hear tonight sort of uh, piques your interest, uh, we're going to be around when the tea and coffee is served. So please just come and ask for any details you want to know at, at all. I will start with Trench 1, which is right as up, as I said, towards Oswald's Gate, which is the earliest known entrance of the fortress, uh, written about in AD 774. Uh, this is one of the disadvantages of doing on a bright summer evening. Uh, I'll try and outline what's going on here. The trench is in two halves. This is the original Trench 1, this lighter patch. Uh, we dug this uh, at this part, in part because we wanted to put a, trial, a trench in is away from the centre of the archaeology, so we're not digging a small keyhole through very complicated stratigraphy, that stratigraphy being the, the, the layers of archaeology. And the other is that there's a part of the medieval curtain which we were curious to see if we, if we can identify why it was surviving. And we we're also looking for earlier phases of defence, which we think we've got here within the trench as a, as a, a rubble foundation for what we think is a timber phase of defence. Basically, uh, previous to about a thousand years ago, now we're thinking perhaps a little earlier than that, but, but, but for most of the fortresses, perhaps 5,000 years of occupation, the defences would have been predominantly timber. And we do have uh, inklings of uh, these earlier defensive lines within the trench, including post settings, uh, and this, this uh, continuous timber um, foundation. But we also identified, and I'll, I'll draw my finger on it, because the chances of you spotting it on the side are, are fairly remote, unfortunately. We have part of a, of a wall line that construction trench for a timber building here, it turns a right angle, runs back across almost the full width of the trench, turns another right angle and comes out here. And within it, there's a broader but smaller, uh, um, again, hole, well, making a, a, a well, I suppose, L-shaped right angle. These appear to be two buildings, uh, one within the other, so they are sub sequential, they're not in, in existence at the same time. From our dating evidence and everything we can tell, the, the, that uh, thin trench is part of a timber hall of Middle Saxon date. Uh, its style, they've been dug up in a number of places, including by Hope Taylor at Yevering. Uh, so we know the kind of, of architectural repertoire that's going on at that time. So that appears to be a Middle Anglo-Saxon hall, perhaps 7th, 8th century in date. Uh, within it, we've got what is apparently the hole left when you take away a stone wall. Uh, we call it a robber cut, a robber trench. A one worked masonry block survived in that, and the wall appears to have been robbed out at the very beginning of the 12th century. If it had been later that century, we'd found a lot more pottery and of different styles. So again, that could be uh, a late Anglo-Saxon stone hall replacing the Middle Saxon timber hall, or just possibly a very early Norman stone building. Uh, but we think that both of them are associated with Oswald's Gate and that they are um, aligned to the gate. So they, they may well be the Gate Ward's Hall, uh, the chap who basically controls who comes and goes from the fortress. So quite a, a high status job. And the, the, the scale of these buildings, one of them may well be 7 by 14 metres, which is pretty substantial, probably reflects that. Uh, the reason we have uh, the trench in two halves is having identified these buildings a couple of years ago, we decided to extend the trench all the way to the gate to uncover uh, the majority of the ground plans and try to identify internal features. So at the moment we're excavating our way through uh, a series of later high medieval deposits and at the end of last season we got back to about the 12th century, perhaps the latter half of the 12th century. You may just about be able to make out um, a whole area of quite substantial cobbling. Uh, that appears to be a yard or, or hard standing out, uh, set around uh, a timber building which survives mostly um, as a gap, as a hole. I don't know if you can just make out, you see the, where the stone pretty much stops, there's, there's a line running up there, and another right angle. This is taken when we've had some of the cobbling out, but we've got what is the rectangular gap left by the, uh, uh, the, the, the rotting away of a timber building. And if you can make out these, what look like little flecks, are actually fines tags. And this is one of the, this photograph was taken as we were excavating through this floor level and from that we're getting dozens and dozens and dozens of silver gilt little uh, horse harness pieces, so the, the little rivets that hold uh, leather work together. So it looks like uh, there's, there's 
So where we think equestrian material in that area, uh, just perhaps hung, hanging on the walls, fallen off, the leather's rotted away, and we're getting this, this scatter of little finds on the, on the ground. And they're, they're, they're tiny, but they're, they're fascinating little things. And as we dug through, this is a, the floor half excavated, uh, you can see that there's pe um, pebbles and cobbles, so we're digging down onto a horizon where burning is starting to show through. And literally just yesterday, uh, Neil, uh, our Trench One supervisor, has uncovered a half of a series of features. So that, thankfully, is starting to make sense. However, as we, when we lifted that floor, we found this. Um, I don't know if you can make out these fragments here. These are sherds of a, of a pottery vessel. Uh, it seems to have been substantively intact. It's crushed and the floor laid on top of it. And this, our pottery expert, has tentatively called Bambra ware, because it's this Bambra is the first place she's, she's seen pottery of this type. So it may well be that there was a, a localized pottery industry somewhere in the, in the immediate vicinity, not necessarily within the castle. You need clay and water and such like, but somewhere perhaps in the borough here in the village or, or in, the, in the immediate vicinity, uh, we have a little uh, local pottery industry. Uh, here in the best editions is one we prepared earlier, it's Jenny Bourne's hands, in fact, our pottery expert. Uh, and you can perhaps see, this is the rim, and then you can see these uh, striations within it as a decoration. It's actually quite pimply, quite, quite thin, um, and, and, and pinkish mostly, uh, sometimes with a bit green on the outside. So it, it's, it's, once you get your eye in, it's quite obvious, and we do seem to be finding fairly reasonable quantities of it. And it seems to be relatively early pottery. It seems to be at the 12th century, uh, which is interesting because over on Lindisfarne, when you get back pre 13th century, it's almost uh, completely absent of pottery. So Bamber does seem to differ somewhat from its uh, near neighbour. Um, now, trench three. That's the, the big trench right in the centre uh, of the wall and up against <coughs> the, the landward wall of the castle. Uh, the reason we were excavating there was we're effectively inheriting uh, a partially completed excavation started by Dr. Brian Hook Taylor. Um, he was at Bamba in the 1960s, dug a trial trench here, from which the two swords and axe, which featured in the press and many news cuttings when, when they, they came back to the castle a few years ago. Uh, but he clearly liked what he saw because he came back in 1970 after he'd been working at York Minster and started an open area excavation, which is in this area here. Uh, sadly, um, uh, he died before he was able to publish the site, though luckily uh, a lot of the artifacts and, a fair, and the record substantively survives. Um, it was recovered from his apartment after his death, and uh, we now have a digital copy. So what we'd like to do is to finish Hope Taylor's work uh, and publish it along with our own. So to enable us to understand what's going on, despite the fact that we were not the ones who principally excavated it, we are excavating our own parallel trench to his, and every time we get down to a bulk, uh, which is unexcavated material that left in, we excavate that uh, alongside our own. The ultimate aim, obviously, is to produce a nice coffee table book um, that will uh, tell us uh, you know, a, a, a history of Bamber from, we think, well, from the, about the Roman period uh, up to the present day. We know that the site goes much deeper and much earlier, so perhaps uh, in future years, if we can, we'd like to dig all the way to the bedrock and publish a, a sequence of, of archaeological deposit within Bamber that stretches back 5,000 years, which is uh, one of the main reasons why the site is so remarkable. <coughs> back to our original slide here. Um, the, 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 this is our parallel trench here. I'm going to talk about this end, the northern end and then the southern end, because they, they, they seem to be uh, telling us slightly different stories. And we haven't quite made them uh, connect yet. That's one of our goals for this summer. So we'll start at the northern end of the trench. This is looking into the trench. You can see, probably even in the, the, the coral sea conditions, there's two quite large holes. Uh, those are 1914-18 practice latrine pits. Uh, when the castle was a muster point for the army uh, in the 14-18 war, uh, uh, you, you, uh, soldiers practiced uh, digging latrine pits. Apparently, uh, my, my, my story within my family, which I'm, uh, I'd like to think is true, is one of my great uncles um, joined up in 1914. He was a miner, and he thought that mining and some soldier were both different, but at least if you're a soldier, you might get killed in the, in the daylight. He joined up, and he had to come up to Bamber, and apparently he rode up and down the beach on a bicycle with a carved model of a Lee Enfield rifle, and then they shipped him off to the, to the real um, boot camp in France. 
Uh, and then made him a sapper in digging mines under the trenches. So it, it, his idea of um, being the day I didn't quite work out, but thankfully he did survive the war. Uh, this at the, the northern end of the trench uh, is, has caused us some problems. We knew we were, we, were, we were getting into what should be relatively early uh, deposits, but we, were, we kept finding sh um, shards in the fragments of uh, green glazed pottery, which is certainly no earlier than the 13th century in the finds trays. So at the beginning of last year, when we travelled the site back about two or three times, we just left all the finds on the surface instead of putting them into the finds trays and sending them off to be processed. And lo and behold, a circular spread of green glazed pottery appeared localised in one little area, telling us quite clearly that although we were not seeing it very, very well, there was clearly a feature in here, uh, a pit dug from later deposits down into the earlier material. So uh, we're still chasing its edges, but we, we've got its broad outline. Uh, we started to quadrant it. You can see there's basically put two lines across and dig out alternate squares out, and we're digging down into this. We've got broadly most of the edges now. It's been a, a hard and merry chase that it's led us. We're not quite sure how deep it goes. We're still excavating downwards. Um, look quite familiar to some at the back. Uh, <laughs> but this is still here. We were excavating both of these just the other day when I, I went home. Um, it is producing Roman material. We've had a, a very fascinating lead bronze uh, decorated fragment, which Lindsay Ellison Jones thinks may be part of a crater or, or um, a wine mixing vessel of, of quite, quite substantial size, though we have only a tiny fragment, but clearly Roman, there's Roman B, and I think we've also got some Roman greyware pottery from it. So this hole, when it was dug in the later Middle Ages, went deep enough into the, the strata at Bamber to bring up Roman artifacts and go back into the backfill. So we need to resolve this now, I think possibly within the next day, perhaps next week, uh, I'd like to have this feature all put to bed and understood. And then we can move on to the early uh, medieval material. Uh, we have had some fascinating finds last year. Again, this looks like a, a terrible uh, mush on the screen, but it, you can see perhaps just about make out a rim of something. It's made of iron. It's about fist size, uh, and well, when we came out, I think, gosh, could it be a shield boss? But then we were a bit sceptical. But thankfully, uh, Bob Collins of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, who spends his, all his day, his working day, identifying artifacts that metal detectors have found, said, good gosh, that's a shield boss. So we think it probably is. So we've got a shield boss um, from the bulk that Hope Taylor left in, adjacent to the southern part of our excavation, which fits in with a, with a solid background of metalwork that's appearing here. Uh, the shield boss was found literally just off this slide. You, uh, even on good seeing conditions, it, it's not easy to see the edge, but the Hope Taylor trench edge, the deeper section, runs around there. All on this side is our excavation. Now this, this surface was probably last walked upon in the sort of 10th, 11th century, so looking at what is in Yorkshire the Viking Age, though there, there were very few Vikings in Northumberland, uh, it remained part of an Anglo-Saxon um, uh, landscape, uh, ruled over by a, a series of uh, well, earls, as they later become known, ruling from Bamford, who seem to have directly associated with themselves. One of them even signs himself, um, here I go, if I bet, High Reeve of Bamford on a Southern English charter, I think of King Edward. Um, but we're getting a whole series of, of little features here. So there's lots of stones appearing out from, from the silt poking through, and also patches of burning appearing, ash, um, charcoal, you know, greys and, uh, and red uh, colours appearing. We've got a sort of horseshoe sheet, a horseshoe shaped um, set of stones on their edge with, with flat stones within them. It's some form of setting, it's not impossible, it's a hearth, it's not directly associated with obvious burning, but that's not necessarily uh, to suggest it isn't, it could have just been kept relatively clean. Um, and also, this area, we are picking up lots of metalwork. I think you may just about make out a little bit of colour there. And again, these characteristic little flecks, the finds tags that are marking small finds. Now, from this area, we've got quite a lot of copper-based products, brooches, pins. We're also getting ironwork. Um, quite a number of, of, of knives, uh, of even of sacks, a, a sort of single-sided short sword. And we are also, um, where you see the pipe disappearing out, quite close to where Hope Taylor found the two swords and axe, the Anglo-Saxon swords. But we're not far from that level, and we're only about a yard or so, perhaps a yard and a quarter, from the actual find spot. 
So it may well be that those swords and axe are part of a, 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 a quite considerable volume of metalwork which is, is on the ground here, which may be associated with, it could be melting down, it could be primary manufacture. Telling the difference, um, I'll point out where this is, is actually, that might make sense. Uh, it could be primary manufacture, it could be uh, melting down and reuse of materials. As I say, that's the story we're going to try and elucidate this summer if we possibly can. Um, this burnt patch here, we produced um, uh, what looked like something uh, dark charcoal with a bit of fibrous quality of it. And we rather, we thought cleverly, put it under a, a, a tub because we thought it was put a layer from earlier poking through slightly and we needed to reduce the levels around it to, to, so that we're at a similar date and level. And then we went to deal with this feature right in the last few days of the dig, which proved to be um, somewhat traumatic because what it was, was the tip of a, of a coin board poking out of the ground. This is the cleaned up uh, feature. Gosh, you're going to struggle to see this. You may have to take my word for this, but there are lozenge-shaped little circular pieces all over this uh, dark carbonized fibrous material. Each one of them is an Anglo-Saxon coin called a Stiker. Um, they're tiny little things, they fit on the end of your finger and they're, they're predominantly copper. They start with a, with a, with a reasonable silver content in the, in the 790s and get rapidly debased. Uh, and uh, what we very quickly realized, they were, they were agglomerated into a group with all of this, this fiber, what appeared to be fibrous dark material, so they, they may have been associated with a container. So after some hurried phone calls, um, Chris Capel of Durham University thankfully came to lift this as a block to take it away to the laboratory. It's currently in the British Museum, which should hopefully, fingers crossed, be back at Bamber and on the space within weeks, uh, we hope at least. But uh, Chris Capel managed to lift this rather awkwardly. Um, you can see again here, can you make out that with the thin colour? Just that, that is one of the coins on edge, this is where we, part of it come away. And again, you can see one or two more of them stacked there. For scale, that's the top of a four inch nail sticking out in the corner there. Um, so you can see that, that these coins are not much wider in diameter than the head of, an, of, a, of a four inch nail. Uh, this, is, this is the lifting, uh, you support around it. Um, dig around it, get a, a shovel underneath, flip it over, bind it up, and it, as, a, as this rather crude package, this is how it goes off to the laboratory. The British Museum have excavated them out of the block. Um, they're currently writing the report. It'll be back at Durham University for final conservation imminently, and back with us, at which point we should be able to read the names on quite a number of them. This is one of the x-rays that the British Museum took of the block. Uh, there, uh, no, sorry, Durham University took up the block before it went down to the BM. Um, again, they, they're, they're shadowy obviously because the x-rays have to penetrate right through. But you can make out hints of writing in places, I think. Uh, that one's not too bad, that one particularly shows it up. Uh, the count, as far as we can tell, is around 70 coins. Um, but the fact that we can, we can make out some of the decorations, some of the surfaces, um, on the x-ray does bode well that we'll be able to get the, the kings and munias and bishops names from these and hopefully it will add substantially to our knowledge of, uh, of coins at Bamber because we are finding a lot of them now in Trench 3 which brings open all the questions that Liz, the late Liz Peary posed as to whether or not there could be a mint at Bamber in the 9th century. Uh, it would be nice to be able to answer those questions in the next few years. This again is another x-ray showing Coins. The one right in the top corner, you can see a little cross in the centre and the name on the outside. That shows up particularly well. If anyone's wondering what I'm talking about, it's this one up here. And the next one again, you can see a circle with a cross within it. So the decoration on the face of the coins should show up very well. Uh, this is just a, 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 you can see this is the, the area near the stikers. We're getting a scatter of them and other artefacts around that area. You can see the burnt patch showing up particularly well there is this ash which is probably part of an industrial waste product from lots of metalworking activity going on. Uh, this is just a, one of a, our, our knife blades, there's the, the tang um, there. I suspect those are Kate's hands at the back and maybe we can compare them later if she's showing you a fine. That's the knife blade. Uh, we're getting a lot of this material so as I say probably industrial something like that. This is the section of Hope Taylor's um, trench looking, that's the horseshoe shaped feature I was pointing out before, the coins that just came from just beyond. 
this is the vertical section through, so you can see there's a substantial depth of material and then you, we get down onto a, a, a stone structural hard standing or possibly even foundation for a timber building. This is a, a, a lay, layers and layers of, of, of ash, of silt and of, of shell midden. So there's a, quite a considerable accumulation of waste material. A lot of it seems to have an industrial character. Um, all to be dug through over the next few years. Right, very briefly, um, I'll tell you, I'll, I will go over our discoveries um, from around the chapel in 2008 when we were lucky enough to do a small rescue excavation when the, uh, the, the borders were being replaced from, from flour to, to gravel. Uh, this, is the, this is the chapel. In 2004, following uh, a radar and uh, resistivity survey, when we erroneously thought we had a crypt at one end, uh, we dug two trial trenches uh, into the main body of the church. Um, and this proved to be very interesting. Uh, it certainly demonstrated there wasn't a crypt, but we did find that there were other features. Um, this, these are wall lines uh, identified by Cadwallader Bates in the 1890s during the time of the castle's reconstruction. You can see the outline of our two trial trenches and this area around here is the areas of excavation in 2008 where we, we literally dug the flower beds or out as an archaeological uh, excavation, uh, identifying some fascinating material. This is a wall we found in the trial trench, this is in the body of the church, that's a the corner of a, of a stone wall it comes in here, turns right and goes out there. This is the corner coin stone. Um, it stands about that high on the ground. You can see the corner is, is cut away from another block to fit into it. It's very characteristic in style of construction of Anglo-Saxon masonry. Professor Cramp saw this kind of, uh, of, of cutting away of rock, of stone and such like at Weirmouth and Jarrow. So uh, we can have some confidence we're looking at an Anglo-Saxon wall underneath Henry II's chapel. This is the wall as it appears uh, in trench uh, seven, which is the next trench up. You can see it coming out. There's the east-west alignment of the chapel. Here's a very variant alignment of this Anglo-Saxon phase of, of what we think is Anglo-Saxon phase of masonry. Uh, this just shows you um, the unaltered photograph and this one with the, with the dotted line showing you the wall line coming in. As you can see, well off in east-west alignment, so uh, not a good candidate for the Basilica of St. Peter but certainly very indicative of, 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 a, of a repertoire of stone building at Bamber predating the Norman uh, phase of occupation. This uh, briefly outlines where we, we are in terms of our additional excavations. Here's our two trial trenches with the wall turning its right angle and we've now seen an excavation around in this area. So that has uncovered further wall lines uh, so we do now have a better understanding of the inner wall. If you look back slightly, this is the wall line coming in here. This is going to be a photograph of that little, I suppose we could call it the trial trench or trial border in fact. Uh, right at the top of, the, pe of the, the slide, there's a big masonry block and then another masonry block. It's been chiseled away because it's been used as the foundations of the 12th century church, but it's clearly this wall line emerging from underneath uh, Henry II's chapel. So we know that that wall line uh, continued on into the grassed area beyond. This is the uh, this is the apse of the church curving around. This is where, what the, what started all of the uh, the excavations around the church. Davy, uh, the groundsman, came down to the trenches and said, "You know, I reckon I've got a wall." And he was quite right. He uh, uncovered one block, then a second block, and then a third block. At which point he thought. Yeah, that's a wall. It certainly wasn't wrong. But again, you can see it's, it's a, at a variant alignment to the, uh, the later uh, Norman church. This is the, uh, the, the corner of the, uh, the apse coming in. You can see some massive foundations in here. Perhaps, again, on a slightly different alignment, um, possibly indicative of, of more than one phase here. This may be that we're looking at uh, two phases rather than just the church uh, foundations that were not 100% certain yet, it was too small a hole to be, to be really clear. Uh, this is the, the wall that Davy found, um, photographed from above, you can see it's alignment running in here. It's big blocks with a chamfered edge, we, it looks like perfectly Norman, Norman architecture so we're, we're assuming it predates the church by only a few decades. Further along um, 
You can see the foundations of the church here. That's the medieval 12th century church foundations. And next to it, we had a massive hard standing, which we think extended out to over the constable's tower, part of the, the high medieval defensive repertoire of the fortress. But within this, here, two more blocks at an odd angle. Uh, and these ones were externally plaster rendered. This is, the, this is them. Um, yeah, you can almost see these with this type. Block here, block there, and just on this bit, adhering to it, and there, uh, a plaster, quite clear lime mortar plaster on this wall line. And again, predating the 12th century church. Um, the trial trenches show, again, the, the foundations of the church. This is a buttress that's been added to, again, church foundations. But at the bottom of it, a mixture of mortar and rubble has a really solid hard standing. Again, well, we can't be 100% certain this is nothing to do with the church, but it, it could well be that we're looking at something which predates the church. But of course, we're, we're dealing with very small trenches here, so we're not 100% certain. So this is one of the reasons why the radar survey, which can look deeper into the ground, may be particularly useful in, in interpreting, interpreting things this summer. Uh, another wall line right at, the, uh, at the, the west end of the church. <coughs> this one turned out, thankfully, because it was getting very confusing at this point, uh, to be later. Uh, than the church. Just you see these beautifully pecked ashlar blocks butting up against the church foundations. Apparently part of a series of uh, later high medieval buildings. Uh, so we're uncertain as to whether what Bates saw in the 1890s um, against the, uh, the inner wall, wall, wall curtain wall is this phase of high medieval architecture or a hint of one of these of earlier Norman or Anglo-Saxon uh, structures that lie under the church. And this is, again, is the wall face. This is the, the wall that Davy originally found. Uh, we dug down in front of that a little triangular gap to try and get some dating evidence. So you can see this is the wall, that, there's the chamfer course. And we saw what we thought was the, uh, the foundations of the wall. And then we realized that the wall had actually been cut in from this level, and that this was something that had predated this early Norman wall. So we continued to investigate and we found here the Norman wall sitting on a very unusual mudstone kind of structure, several courses uh, surviving. But now we've got uh, Henry II's chapel built from in the 1160s sitting on what we think is an earlier Norman defensive alignment which sits on another wall alignment. Now here we are three phases effectively of masonry. So this one must be relatively early. So if I had to bet uh, my house that I was looking at an Anglo-Saxon or earlier phase of defense, this would be it. Uh, it. It's clearly relatively early. It's relatively crude in its construction. It has even some elements of dry stone wall quality about it. Uh, it's a fascinating find. It may well be some of the earliest defenses at Bambrook. <coughs> and fascinatingly early, but also stone. And just to add uh, one last little surprise, as we were excavating down to expose the face of that wall, we found a disarticulated human body. <laughs> um, you can perhaps make out two parts of the pelvis. Uh, clearly demonstrated the body is not uh, in its normal alignment. Uh, that's a thigh bone and some shin bones down there. I mean, it's nothing like complete. Uh, they're the bigger bones that seem to have survived. This material here, we think, is an infill where they've extended the inner wall. They've put a new wall in, an infill between the new wall and the older wall. So I think this, this deposition is just 12th century and broadly uh, contemporaneous with the construction of Henry II's chapel. Why is there a body here? Well, uh, Sarah is going to have a look at it uh, this summer to see if she can get a set up. We have, a, a, obviously, a good idea of what bodies at Bambo from the Anglo-Saxon period look like. We've got a cemetery site with about 80 of them and it should be published next year. Um, if I was going to pluck a guess as to what this is doing here out of the air, I'd suggest that uh, the, the Normans are cl clearly completely remodeling the castle um, and it may well be that they've demolished the Basilica of St. Peter and they're building the new church of St. Oswald. Um, so they may well have disturbed the burial from the, the, the basilica and they may have simply disposed it in the backfill. Um, that would be my best guess. Uh, clearly we're going to need a bit more work if we're going to confirm that one. But a carbon date on the bone would certainly help us. And just to, to try and 
put a bit of interpretation on what on all this, this very walls I've been flashing up on a, on a slide for you. Here's the alignment of that wall in our 2004 trial trenches. Uh, you can see it coming out there, which we've seen it confirmed that it comes out from underneath the church there. Here's the, the Norman wall with the earlier wall underneath it. And here is the alignment of the uh, wall with the external plaster render on it. You can see that they're all broadly similar. So uh, it, it is possible that we're looking here at one building uh, which, which may have been externally plastered. It's possible we're looking at two, um, but certainly we're not seeing evidence of, of, of another stone building. So I, I think what we have is one candidate for uh, an Anglo-Saxon rectangular stone building underneath the basilica, underneath the church of St. Oswald, uh, with a phase of defensive rampart just beyond it. So it's either built directly against or perhaps just inside of the, of the original defensive perimeter, which we think runs along here and turns a right angle through here. This bowing out, uh, I think, is, is a, a later 12th century extension of the inner ward you can see the where it turns an angle uh, near the constable's tower. So I think that this is, is ex it's turned an angle, it's, it's extended slightly down the slope, it's backfilled together and the church is put into this new corner that's created especially for it. Um, so that's the interpretation that we have at the moment. Clearly if we get a radar survey which, which will let us look in the ground, and we do not just within the church, this area here, but the whole of the ward, uh, we may pick up a lot of walls and this all might fit, you know, we've got a jigsaw puzzle, suddenly we get a look at the, the, the picture on the front of the box because we've only got three or four pieces. We may be much better informed by July than we are at the present time. Um, I'm going to, very literally two minutes, going to mention um, the new project that we started at Bradford Canes, which is this sinuous feature on, as you drive out towards the A1, about halfway to the A1. It's a geological feature. Uh, I think this is Greenwood's map, um, one of the earlier maps. Yeah, you can see that the Canes deposit, Bradford. you can see this, this water drainage area here and goes into uh, a, a, what's new and bog, Embleton bog, uh, in this area. The railway line runs through it and uh, when it was excavated through, the, uh, uh, they found great ore, these, these gigantic uh, deer. We're, we're test pitting from the, the dry ground into what was once wet land, now relatively dry but full of peat. So we're heading into this water drainage scheme which um, after the last glaciation would have been a series of lakes eventually draining through the, the topography into Bugle Bay. Uh, it, it's a fascinating lands here because you, you, certainly in the Mesolithic period it's very rich in, in wildlife and on the, these lake margins, often very reedy lake margins, you get a lot of human activity. Uh, mostly we find um, flint, which obviously doesn't rot. But as you go into the, the, the peat deposits, being you know, anaerobic without oxygen, it will preserve the sort of wood and leather and other materials, including bog bodies on very rare occasions, that you just don't normally see um, from very long um, periods ago. So, fingers crossed, we may hit a settlement area. Christian sent me this photograph. Um, this is looking into the, the new and loft in the bog area. I think you can just about make out where the water is standing on the surface. Uh, it's one of the, the few bits which is still relatively wet. Uh, the rest of it is, is quite heavily drained, but once you get below the topsoil and dig down a little bit, you get this dark black peat deposit. So this is uh, hopefully a, a new chapter. <coughs> one of the best things we may get from this are deep cores, uh, which will give us pollen sequences, so we'll be able to reconstruct what's growing in the landscape, and we'll see the kind of crops uh, that have been grown in the, in the, the, the landscape. And we compare these with the, the, the charred cereal grain we get out of the soil and waste products within the castle. Um, and that is it for tonight. Uh, thank you for your, uh, your time. Uh,